I think we, we got pretty lucky um, in the topical realm over the past couple of years. You gotta realize in context, um, from the, the start of dermatology in, in earnest, 19th century, to about late 1950s, it was a tar, mercury, arsenic. Um, th those were the main drugs that were used. Late 1950s, topical steroids are described first systemically and then topically, thought not to work, and then Sulzberger did some work and he showed that. And then we go from the 1950s to 2000 before we get a really effective topical, right? I mean, and calcipatriene, calcitriol, they're marginally effective drugs. And I know we use them and we, we add them onto topical steroids. And then for eczema, we get tacrolimus in like 2000 and pimacrolimus 2001. They work. They work. They're non-steroidal. They're effective. They burn when they go on a little bit. But one's an ointment, one's a cream. Then, then we get chrysoboral, but it takes like another 15 years. And now all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, we get topical ruxolitinib, topical topinarof, and topical rifumilast. And they work, right? They actually work, you know, when you look at uh, calcitriol or, or calcipotriene, like the Dovinex and, and, and the Taclinex thing, you know, the difference between the steroid and, the, and adding the vitamin D, it's very marginal impact from the vitamin D. It's a little bit, but it's... So topinarof is a new mechanism of action. It's called an aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist. Uh, aryl uh, hydrocarbon receptors are on... Uh, prehistoric type animals. It's a very fundamental system of monitoring the environment. And unlike other receptors, um, you know, you have an IL-13 receptor. Guess what? Just IL-13 will fit in that. Nothing else will fit in it. Most cellular receptors are like a lock and a key. The key has to fit perfectly in that lock to turn it. These uh, defensive um, mechanisms, particularly aryl uh, hydrocarbon, can accept multiple agonists. And the irony of this is not every agonist causes the same response. Some agonism of aryl-CoA is anti-inflammatory, but others that hit the same receptor, other ones, are pro-inflammatory. So you put the wrong irritant chemical on, you put the wrong U UV light on there, you rub too hard, it's pro-inflammatory. You put a different uh, agonist on, it's anti-inflammatory. Very clever and engineered this way. Like th there's a pretty well understood receptor and they know different ways of doing. So this to pin her off in this particular circumstance, you'll see a whole variety of things that it does positively for inflammatory diseases. I think it's probably not terribly important to get into the detail of it, but uh, it's proved now 1%. It's in a cream form. It's once a day. It is actually what we asked for, right? We asked for a pharma for elegance and once a day, and they delivered us. Rux is twice a day. Probably works pretty well once a day. But th that's what we got here. Uh, next slide. And uh, so the soaring um, studies were um, looking at this in uh, psoriasis and plaque psoriasis. And um, th this was a um, uh, pretty moderate disease. And what you're seeing is once daily, you're seeing a global assessment of zero, one, the endpoint. And, and a lot of these you could see started out um, with um, baseline demographics. You see a third had an IgA of three and a third had an IgA of two. Pretty substantial visual disease. And, and the gray is placebo. There's a big separation between placebo and active. It's an effective drug, right? So it works in psoriasis. And one other thing is they did this long-term study. They felt that they had a mechanism that had durable response, that if you can calm this defensive posture that's anti-inflammatory, it could stick. So what they did was basically, if you were clear or had a one, you, you didn't take any drug. Once you started to pop into a two, you restarted the drug and you just kept 
going into that, that circle. If we go to the next slide, it, you see there's a very durable response of clear or almost clear, and some patients can go out months between clear periods without using the drug. Now, it's not completely clear, it's clear or almost clear. But I think what I get out of this is not so much treat till you're better and then stop, but treat till you're better and let's find a comfortable place to use it intermittently to keep you going and understanding that skip days and skip week won't bite you back, right? It's not like a topical, super potent topical steroid that you're using for poison ivy and use it for a week or two and the minute you stop, you get an explosion of activity. That's not happening here. Um, so complete disease clearance uh, beyond 12 weeks, it, this is a, a really a consequential impact and uh, works very well. It's very elegant, the vehicle. I think we've got one more slide here. Yeah, on, on adverse effects. So, they're again, showing durability of response um, with different groups, vehicle into topinarov and then topinarov into topinarov when you convert into an open label. So the things you watch out for are folliculitis, right, and uh, contact dermatitis. So what I usually tell patients is, look, you're going to put this on. I don't have a lot of uh, I, I don't have a lot of side effects to talk to you about. In fact, I have no scary side effects to talk to you about. But if you see little pimple-like things forming in the area you're applying it, just hold it for a little while, wait for it to pass, and then you can start using it again because it often doesn't come back. And if you know if you're getting itchy or red, um, back off. See if it's happening on all the sites. If it may only happen on one site, then you could stop it, let it clear, and, and go back to it. Um, so I, I've added this in frequently uh, in, in the most body sites. So this is for plaque psoriasis in adults once a day. Thoughts on no. okay. All right. All right. Okay. So um, fortunately, uh, we now have multiple non-steroidal options for our uh, patients with the plaque psoriasis. I'm going to talk about topical roflumilast cream. Um, so roflumilast is a PDE4 inhibitor. And earlier today, we talked about sort of the mechanism of PDE4 inhibitor in the context of oral an oral PDE4 inhibitor of premolast. However, this is uh, applied topically, and it's a different uh, PDE4 inhibitor. Roflumilast uh, as a PDE4 inhibitor, if you're looking at molar per molar, compared to the other types of PDE4 inhibitor, it's actually quite potent, and uh, which makes it perfect for a, sort of a topical formulation. And it's uh, once a day, as you can see here, um, as it's indicated for all severities of plaque psoriasis. In the prescribing information, it also include uh, the language about including intertriginous areas. Um, and Another differentiating factor in terms of the prescribing language is that it's, uh, you can prescribe it for patients 12 years and older. Uh, Vitama is for 18 years and, and older. Uh, I, I shall just point out, Vitama, even though it doesn't have, including intertriginous, it doesn't have language of prohibiting it That's for that area. So I just wanted to clarify. Great, and then next slide, please. So here we're looking at how topical roflumilast did in its clinical trials. Um, so for this clinical trial, um, also mostly actually when you look at the inclusion criteria, mostly moderate patients with some mild, some severe. And what you see here, and this is week eight data, um, and what you see is that when you're achieving um, clear or almost clear uh, with at least a two-point reduction in uh, the IgA score, uh, and they, that's how it, the, the treatment success is defined. So you, you take patients who are either mild, moderate, or severe. Most of the patients are moderate. They have to have at least a two-point reduction, right? And, and they achieving that end achieving clear, almost clear. So pretty high bar uh, for a topical uh, endpoint. Same endpoint as what Dr. Cohen said earlier for Chapinarov uh, Chepinero as well. So for roflumilast, as you can see by week eight, about 41% of the patients will have achieved this IgA success compared to 
5.8% uh, or 6% in the vehicle group. And uh, similar results in the, in the sister study. Next, please. Here we're looking at um, IGA, uh, IIGA, which is intertriginous uh, area. Um, so this medication, I would say, is very well tolerated in the intertriginous areas. And as you can see, the efficacy is also uh, notable in the intertriginous areas in both of these studies. Next, please. Okay. So this is the uh, summary of the adverse events by body surface area. It's also a vision test. And uh, <laughs> um, there will be another slide a little later that talks about the uh, safety profile as well. But the main thing here is that uh, whether you apply topical reflumolase to those with low body surface area, more moderate, you know, five to 10, or more severe, Overall, I would say it's pretty well tolerated. There are certain rates that go up a bit, um, go up a little bit, I would say, when you're kind of going up in the body surface area, uh, mainly in the area of, um, relatively speaking, some diarrhea in the clinical trials. I think in the real world, and I'll be curious to hear about our experience later on, I haven't seen that uh, in my experience. Um, but they're, uh, so, so this is a breakdown. So overall, as you can see, very well tolerated. Next, please. And, let's, okay. let's So before we go into, let's just pause for a sec uh, before we go to bio, biosimilars about, so these are two relatively newly approved topical agents for patients with plaque psoriasis, non-steroidal, no limitations on the body surface area, which is good for psoriasis because the parts of the body that are affected, sometimes you worry about safety in those areas and we want to avoid using high potency topical corticosteroids, even low potency topical corticosteroids because they're occluded. The face, you know, eyelids, neck, scalp, genitals, um, skin folds, uh, crease of the rear end. So it's really, this is, as Dr. Cohen pointed out, you know, it's been years before we had something that was number one, effective <laughs> um, as a monotherapy agent and tolerable. So um, these two agents have been really um, big players in helping us reduce. We still use topical corticosteroids and super potent ones, but being able to reduce their use and use these, it's been a really nice uh, change in the way we treat patients with psoriasis. In terms of side effects um, in the real world, um, 60 grams, um, each of them is 60 grams, but with respect to reflumolase and the, the GI diarrhea side effect, I have not seen, have been, I've not, uh, no patient has reported that to me yet. Mm -hmm. A couple of other things, just a spoiler alert, alert for future, uh, probably not the, the next one in Phoenix, but the next live one after that. Both um, Tepinarof and Rufumilast have uh, announced positive phase three results of their topical creams and eczema, right? So you're gonna hear that come up in our eczema talks. I know at the European Academy, there's a number of posters and presentations on the final data of both of these. So it's like we got topicals that are gonna work in both diseases. Um, and when you look at these side effect profiles, nothing's keeping you awake here. Just nothing, more, you know, once a day um, like that. And Rifumilast has been on the market for years as an oral medicine uh, for like a COPD, I think. So uh, there's a lot of toxicity data on it that makes it a, these, good, these are good drugs. So this is a great drug for when the pathology comes back and says psoriasiform oh, dermatitis. You they're, they're both good for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just thinking when you look at the, the side effects and we're looking at BSA of 10% or greater, obviously this would be a drug where if, you're, if you have a patient that's sitting in front of you that has 10% BSA or greater, you might be getting them started on this while you're thinking about a systemic agent, right? A small molecule or a biologic. This is not a, you're going to be doing this long-term monotherapy 